just as I normally I say, uh, I have invented the flying car. You know, I have invented a car that can fly. How is it? Well, you know what? You want a flying car? Find a good engineer. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and what? So my opinion, and again, uh, you can begin to raise your hand and uh, tell your opinion. My opinion is that uh, the dimensional modeling is incomplete because it doesn't basically doesn't say how to do multi multi fact uh, queries. So when you have a query against a fact table with the, uh, all the dimensions around, yeah, okay, connect client ID with client ID, product ID with product ID, great, okay. But then it doesn't say what to do when you have two fact tables which have uh, uh, shared dimensions because uh, it says independently against the shared dimensions, but it doesn't say how to, uh, to query them at the same time. So, and then my methodology goes beyond because uh, in my methodology, you do not need conform dimensions. So there's an entire chapter dedicated to this. You can make a, a, a data model where the product table is at two different granularities. So in one table is uh, at product ID level and the other is at product category level. And uh, this met methodology that I'm showing in the book shows how to deal with that. Just to position where the unified schema is, I want to tell you one thing. This is a schema that how many times we have seen it. So there are data sources, there is an enterprise data warehouse, which is made of a staging area, a core layer, and a few data marts. And then the data marts are delivering the information to the BI tools, to the reports and dashboards, and whatever other information delivery channel you want to create. Um, fine, good, wonderful. But this is incomplete. So this schema is what we see in every book, but it's not a real picture of the world. So there is an additional layer that I call the phantom layer. It's a phantom. It's not in any book, but it is there in the facts, in your day-by-day -day life, there is an additional layer. So when the data warehouse is finished and you are the person in charge to deliver information to the BI tools, dashboards, and so on, what do you do? You just connect and everything is plug and play? No, it doesn't work like that. So you need to do additional ETL. Sometimes the company even needs to buy an additional ETL tool like Alteryx to take these data marts, which are supposed to be ready, but they are not ready. So take this data mart and mess up with them again to make them ready. Um, so the, this layer exists, but it's never mentioned. But that's basically the job of, of uh, the day-by-day -day life of many people who are working in the in the data delivery um, section of the data warehouse and especially the people who are working in the bi teams or if you have friends who or yourself do data science everyone in data science agrees that 90 80 percent of the time is spent in, in doing data prep but uh, they don't even call it data preparation. They call it data prep to say it shorter so they, they have more time to work. So the, the data prep basically is the phantom layer. So people take a da data from a data warehouse and they start messing around. And if a project of data science is two months, they probably spend a month and a half in working on the phantom layer and then they build their model. I breathe. If you have questions, it's time for you to. There, there are no questions at the moment. Okay, wonderful. So let's move forward. So what I want to say is that data modeling approach is like this. Sorry, it's Francesco, really there, there's just someone, Johan has just put his hand up, Johan. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, yes, please, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. Okay, okay. all right, uh, Francesco, I just want to, just a quick question, just to clarify. Um, you mentioned you did data vault. You come from a data vault background as well, or the the methodology you've done that. Is that correct? Uh, I have. I got certified uh, rather for okay. curiosity. So I okay. I don't define myself an expert of data vault. I'm certified, but I'm not an expert. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, the, actually, hence my question. So the staging area and the core layers going on to data mart before you get to the phantom layer. Uh, does it matter then what methodology that you actually are going to follow, like maybe even a Kimball or Data Vault to to actually get the core or the raw vaults and then 
build your data marts? Actually, does that matter? Very good or, question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I got your question. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for asking. You're totally right. I should I should have mentioned this is in general. So this that I was drawing. I don't even know, I just found it from the internet, an image of a data warehouse. I guess this could be a, an Inmon data warehouse. But uh, yeah, it definitely applies to Inmon. It definitely applies to Data Vault uh, because uh, I'm having, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much in the Data Vault community and I tend to speak a lot with the people from the Data Vault community. And they all agree that when it comes to information delivery, they call it information mart. But uh, yeah, it's basically the same thing as data mart. It's just a different name but it has the dimensional modeling and they all admit, they all acknowledge, including Dan Listed himself, they all acknowledge that uh, uh, data marts are a place where the end users are typically uh, experts of data who are expert in SQL. So it's very, very far from delivering data ready for business users. So it's all approaches and more than ever, Kimball. Kimball is preparing the data marts, but as I said before, it doesn't prepare how to merge them. So whenever you have a data mart about sales and a data mart about purchases, yeah, they are two data, like they are two star schemas. And if you want to compare by product, the sales versus the, the purchases, like you were buying from a supplier and you sell to, to some uh, client. Uh, if you want to do this, you already need to create some SQL because there is not a data mart prepared for that. Or, okay, if it has been created, yes, but it cannot have all the combinations. So you always need to do some additional coding with all the approaches. Okay, thank you. All right. So, yeah, I have to try to go, I have a few slides, but they are very like uh, image, a lot of images, not much of words. So in this slide, you see from the images that you typically have, uh, do you guys see my mouse moving on the screen? Like if I point on things, do you see yes. it moving? Okay, yes, it's wonderful. So if you have a, a data model, which is uh, like a data source, uh, which is uh, in theory prepared for, for, for being used, nevertheless, when there is a business requirement, you still go to discuss with the end users, and then you prepare a dimensional data mart, and then you prepare a, a report. So the final dashboard the report is based on that data mart. This is the chain. Every time a new client wants something, you're creating a data mart or a uh, or a view, you're doing coding ad hoc. And this is what my book is fighting against. I do not like this because at the end, you have too many data marts customized for, for particular needs. Uh, and, uh, and then it's a jungle and, and it's really a long process because when it comes to writing to uh, a, a new star schema on a database, you don't do that in two days or in one day. You do it in two weeks or in two months. So it's a, it's a disaster. I, I was speaking with people who, whenever someone wants to see sales by product and, and the month, that's already too complex. And you need they start again from the conceptual data modeling. I say, guys, are you crazy? What? It cannot be. It's not life. I mean, we need to stay with our family, with our children. We cannot spend our life creating a data mart every time that someone is asking for something. So I said, we need something new. Because at the end, look. From the same data source, you have a hundred requirements and a hundred star schemas. That's not what we want. So the goal of the unified star schema is to be self-service. So to eliminate the ad hoc approach, the SQL code for each new requirement, and then eliminate in general the need of IT people and data analysts whenever a new business requirement arises. Today, the users do not create reports on their own. It's uh, like if it's happening, it's a, with a 1% of, uh, of probability. Uh, if you have a, a 100 people, there is probably one who is starting from a new Tableau uh, file, new, creating a, a data model, and then creating a report. That's usually not happening. It's done by experts. It's done at all. So the idea is to create a universal data model that serves as a foundation to answer all the possible questions. But then, how do we design a data model before knowing the business requirements? So what I'm saying to the world is crazy. I'm saying, hey guys, I don't need to know the business requirements. So give me your data. I'll give you back your data model. And then you give me your requirements. And yeah, I would probably need to do a bit of adjustments, but most of the work is already done. 
basically the, my way of connecting the data does not depend on business requirements. Mm. Do you remember this guy? This guy is from the movie Pretty Woman. Is the guy on the lift. What is the job of this guy? He's pressing a button. You are at the ground floor. You want to go to the sixth floor. You say, I want to go to the sixth floor. He presses the button and then he goes back to the ground floor. This is a useless job. <laughs> it's a waste of time. I don't envy this guy. Maybe sometimes he's having fun because he's seeing the couple going drunk to the top floor and they're having fun and he's enjoying. But it's boring. It's a boring life. So we, no one, no one wants to do the job of this guy. And uh, well, sometimes I find that the job of an Alan analyst is not so different. <laughs> it's mm. uh, there is so much of. Uh, Oh, I want to sales by product. Okay, yes, I'll do sales by, sales by product. Come on, do we really need that? So the self-service analytics is the capability of retrieving the needed information without the help of an operator. So the goal here is not to, to fire this operator. It's just to give him a better life. My message is that we need data analysts for doing intelligent things, not just pressing a stupid button. That's my core message. I want to help the world to have the analysts doing something clever, something new, some innovation using their brain. And that's what the Unifizer schema is for. So Tableau is like this, we all know it. But is it really self-service? Do you imagine, do you know any, any business people uh, who are able to produce this? The answer is no, I don't. If you tell me yes, <laughs> I'm very curious to hear that. Also because Tableau reads from a data model that is like this one. And this, for example, is the Adventure Works. It's a demo database. It's only 70 tables, but in reality, they, they can be 200, 500, 1,000. So um, business people will never be able to go through this data, look at the documentation, how to join two tables. So and they say that Tableau is self-service, but it's not true. It's self-service because it has the capability of uh, yeah drag and drop, but at the end of the day, the, the business users they need to have the knowledge of their data and they and they they need to know how to connect the tables. So it's really not working uh, this way. Francesca, yeah. Um, so I'm 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 interested in your comment about not needing to understand the requirements. So we've we've got a nice diagram here. Um, and are, are you uh, typically what I th what I think you're saying is is that you you're going to take all of the event data, for example, a sale or some level of production, and you're going to provide the links to every single possible dimension that you have. Is that is that the basic technique that you do to avoid asking for business requirements? I think the next slides uh, will will clarify this. Okay. But uh, I can I can already briefly answer to you. I don't connect sales to every possible uh, to every possible uh, dimension because uh, if you have a dimension called employees and in the sales table there is no information about the employees, there's nothing to to connect. But yeah, the table sales has some foreign keys that refer to whatever, it can be really the employee, it can be the client of the product, it can be the date, so it's the calendar, it can be the shop, it can be the clerk. So whatever foreign key appears in sales, yes, I connect, I pre-connect it to, to all the dimensions that are related to sales. So then okay. I guess you're wondering, okay, if I do that, it will be a mess. And uh, the next slide will show you how I do it. Excellent. Thank so, you. yeah, that's basically what was the next slide. So, and actually, I will have a question uh, to you guys. So, yeah, in every database, the connections are given. So, this is the schema of Northwind. I, I guess most of you know Northwind is the demo database from Microsoft. It is known uh, as a very, very easy, simple database. And you find this documentation online, and you have the table orders, and you have the table order details. And these two tables are simply connecting by order ID. There is no other way to connect these two tables. So they are given. But then, wait a moment. Why are we asking the business users to manually build these connections in Tableau, for example, 
knowing that they are given. So can we not pre-build the connections? So uh, I'm talking about a DIY approach, do it yourself. And I want to make an example of a chair. A chair 20 years ago was looking like this. A chair today looks like this. So you go to Ikea or to whatever other shop, you buy a chair and they give you a box and then you do it yourself. So this apparently looks a bit inconvenient, but it, it makes sense because it has improved the logistics and it has reduced the costs. So a box is easier to put in your car than, than a chair. Imagine if it is a chest of drawers or a wardrobe. So box is smaller and because it's smaller the storage is cheaper and then uh, the price can be cheaper and people are happy to buy cheaper uh, things so this works but then the same very similar has happened with data models so 20 years ago you had for example a data model this is a universe of, of business objects and the pre-join pre -join was invented by them uh, so it was like a, a chair that was already assembled, re ready to use. But then today, the BI leaders have moved back to the DIY approach. So they said, OK, business object is doing the pre-built joints. Instead, with a flow click and Power BI, you just ask the users to build their own chair, to build their own report. And here is a question for you guys. Why do you think that we did this apparent step backwards? Why business objects and cognos and, and also microstrategy, they, they had this model of, a, of a building a, an idea uh, that is for, for one. Uh, and then now Tableau and Click and Power BI, they are uh, saying you either create the report on your own, starting from zero, or you just uh, ask a, a that data expert to create a report ad hoc for you. Why why have we lost that layer that pre-joins all, all the tables? What what do you think? What do you think, guys? Do you have an opinion? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. So just a question. Was the question why have we created the semantic layer? No, no why wow. have we eliminated it? Yeah, because, why aren't uh, we using it anymore? Yeah, empty. <laughs> so, yeah, so... Yeah, what you can say about that is um, why it should be there is basically because business requirements keep being added onto. And uh, so if you've got one requirement initially, Obviously, there's an iterative approach that ends up ultimately happening from a business user perspective because the requirements keep maturing. So, I mean, that kind of puts the semantic layer in um, one of the reasons as to why we should actually have a semantic layer because of that reason. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you for, for your answer. But then I'm asking you, but uh, look at this. I mean, order details and orders, I'll zoom it in. They always join the same way. So the, there is always an order ID in order details, which points to a row of, of uh, order headers. So that's the way to join it. So wh why? how is it possible that our requirement is, uh, is changing uh, the way how we connect the data? Why, why do you think? So, so we have ST. ST is going to hand up. Um, so could, could one of the options be that we just have so many new and extra sources that we get the data from it's not just one source anymore it's many yeah sure sure yeah that's fine but even when you have more extra sources for each source you could do a universe that is uh, connecting the data the standard way so i'm referring to the fact that when you have uh, let's say six sources and you have created all the the universe that connects all the all the star schemas and everything then in theory, you should be done until you have the seventh source. But uh, until that moment, you don't need to change anything in theory, no? So you, you build a universe that is, is uh, connecting all these uh, six sources together. And uh, for example, in, in this slide, I'm showing this was a universe that I created 
uh, which had uh, um, four sources. So these were four fact tables, and all these uh, were the, the possible joints, and the, the, it was using context. So when you were making a query on this, it was activating only the lines that are pertinent to, to this fact table. So this way, it was uh, possible to put in a universe everything and and as long as uh, your data is uh, has not changed the structure in theory you should be happy with that until uh, new data uh, arrives uh, however that somehow they don't use it anymore so you said structure so it could be could it be that with the introduction of NoSQL and unstructured data that structure doesn't look the same anymore Oh yeah, but yeah, that's uh, that would be the the next step. But the problem yeah. are, uh, the problem exists still also with relational. So imagine that you you don't have any any uh, NoSQL data source. In that case, you can say, okay, I can continue using the old approach from business object. But no, they have stopped doing. It's uh, it's disappearing. But isn't that uh, Francesca? Isn't it a situation of the the vendors are desperately trying to get to a point where the business can do everything without talking to technical people. So if if you require a semantic layer, then you are still bound to getting a technical person to update that that technical layer. Uh, of course, you 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 may need to, but it gets much worse if you need to create your your Tableau report from zero. So. <laughs> In any case, uh, at some point you, you need to speak with the technical. But in theory, the, the, that layer was supposed to, to mitigate, to reduce your your relationship with the with the IT, because it was saying, okay, this is a structure and it is for you for doing your self self reporting. But uh, basically, it didn't work. And, and I do have my answer, but uh, but I wanted to to hear from you. So if there is no one more, is there anyone else or shall I continue? No, there's, there's no one else. Okay, so I give you my answer because this is uh, opening to uh, the Unifizer schema. The way to connect the tables following the classic approach, so as it has been until, until, today, until today, is actually not unique. So it is true that you have your, your table, you have um, order details and orders. That's true, they are always connected through the order ID. You will never change that. But there is one thing, uh, different questions need slightly different ways to connect the tables. You may need a left join, a right join. You may need aggregations to confirm granularities. You may need nested select statements. So even if the tables are connecting just that way, but uh, there are all these uh, small different uh, uh, ways to connect, which make a difference. So what happened in my experience is that there was, a, for example, a universe about sales and the universe was making a left join, meaning that you were seeing all the sales, uh, even if uh, there was a sales of a product that was uh, not in the inventory, it was showing the sales. Okay, that's a left join. So it is taking all the sales regardless, fine. But then some people were saying, okay, but I would like now a list of the, all the reports, the, that all, all the, sorry, all the products the, that exist, I want to see all the products, and if the products uh, they have sales, show the sales of this year, and if they don't have any sales, show it null. And this is a typical example where you should make a query against sales, uh, group by a product, and then you should uh, make a right join to the products. And uh, this already is a typical of, of ex example where you cannot use the pre-existing universe because in the pre-existing universe, you must choose the uh, verse of the join. It's either left or right. And if you do a full outer join, uh, in many SQL engines, a multiple full outer join is uh, crushing the SQL. So the result, it happened that uh, then you had multiple universes. So you had one data source, and then you had to make a new universe that was sales-centric, and another that was uh, product-centric. So at the end, you had still a mess because it was not universal. So I propose to change approach. Um, and OK, actually, we don't have enough time for this. But very, very quickly, does anyone know? Because I, I chose the like the, the, the 
scapegoat, like who, who to blame. And uh, in the book, basically, the scapegoat is the fun trap. Everything starts from the fun trap. That is the problem that everyone uh, has, although it's not very clear that you have that problem. So do you know, does anyone know what a fun trap is? I, I know, but that's because I've been through the book and, and spent time with you. Although you might have noticed that the definition that I give in the book does not match any existing definition in literature. Yeah. Is it, is it a word that at least any of you has uh, heard? Hmm. No, so, I never heard it before. You never heard it before. Okay, let me tell you. This is the the king of evil. It's uh, it's the this guy alone is the one who is guilty for a project to having correct numbers. And if you Google fun trap you can find a lot of definitions. Uh, so let me Google very quickly, fun trap, okay. So there are several definitions. Now I'm, go I'm going to take uh, this one, for example. And they say, uh, that's a chasm trap, fun trap. A fun trap occurs when two many to one joins follow one another in primary detail form. And the query includes a measure from both the leaf table and its immediate primary. 90% of the people, when reading this definition, they say, okay, what the hell, I didn't understand the word. Because it's not an easy definition. <laughs> <laughs> but the question you should wonder is, why did anyone gave, give this definition? Why does that matter? Why, why it is so relevant to have to define a thing called the fun trap? Let me say to you, they have defined this because some combinations of tables, they cannot be joined together. And this is a typical example. And this definition is actually bad because it shows three tables. But uh, the problem is actually between these two tables. So if you, even if you disregard customers completely from this uh, equation and you just look at orders and order details, this is already bad. Plus, it is also assuming that this table should have a, a, a measure, which is actually not true. So this definition, although normally a definition should never be wrong because I can define whatever I want, but this definition is wrong. And all the definitions, I challenge you, all the definitions that you will find in literature about fun trap, they are inconsistent and they don't go straight to the point. The point here is very simple. The point that they were trying to make is that when you have two tables, they typically have a different grain. So in the moment when you join them, one is adapting to the grain of the other. So or the details is more detailed. This one is less detailed. If this one, which is the order header, it, normally it does not contain a number, a, a measure. But when it does, and in this case it is order value, in the moment when you join it to order details, this measure becomes duplicated because this table can have a million rows and this can have a half million rows if you have an average two, two rows per order. So when you create a join, you force this table to go to the granularity of this table. And that is also true if this query table that doesn't have an order quantity. If it's just uh, uh, orders and uh, email addresses and you have a number here and for each uh, client ID you have uh, three email addresses, Trust me that it will be tripled the order value. So the definition that you find about fun trap is always wrong. It's a disaster. This website is zooming funny. So, so that's uh, where in my book I have started by changing a definition, and I fill the gap in literature because this definition does not exist. A fun trap for me is a combination of two tables, not three where one table contains a number, so I'm using this symbol of uh, to a number, so table B in this case contains a number, but this table B needs to adapt to the granularity of table A, because the table A is the one with the foreign key. So this is like, uh, uh, like order details, and this is like order headers, right? So it has a foreign key that points to the primary key of this one. And because this one contains a number, 
in the moment when you force this smaller table to have more records than it used to be, those numbers are repeated. This definition is missing in literature. I haven't found, so I please ask you if I'm wrong, uh, chat me, write me on LinkedIn, tell me I found a definition like yours, like the one of your presentation. To my knowledge, it does not exist in literature. And this is the problem because if you don't give a definition of a problem, you cannot find a solution. So many times it happens, and it will happen also when you go to your back to your, to your work tomorrow, that you are making a join between two tables, which form a, a thing that I call fun trap. But if you go to the literature, they don't call it anything. And if they don't give it a name, you don't recognize it, you don't know that it's a threat, and then you don't solve it. So fun trap, according to me, is one table as a number and the other is as a, a more detailed granularity. That's it. Because of this alone, the projects can take one year more than they do. Because you join two tables, no, no one has told you that it's wrong to join these two tables. And then in the moment when, when you go uh, to look at your numbers, or you say, oh, look, the sales uh, amount doesn't match the data source. Oh, let's mitigate the risk. And then a lot of blah, 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 managers speaking. But as a matter of a fact, it's because you have made a join that is wrong and no one has ever told you that it's wrong. I breathe. <laughs> uh, there, there are no questions for you, but we are in agreement, and, and I think we we certainly find that, and, and you constantly do these mins and maxes when you display it to avoid that. Maxes, and in Tableau, they do a thing called LOD, level of detail. So it's quite funny. To me, it's a bit like saying, oh, okay, I, I have a car and that is a wall. You know what? I crash my car against the wall because in any case, I know I'm a mechanic. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, the approach today, and it's been 40 years, is, okay, I create a problem and then I spend time and money to try to solve the problem. And my book ends with the phrase of Einstein, and it says, a clever person solves a problem, but a wise person avoids a problem. And that's what my book is about, is teaching you how to avoid a fun trap. Uh, there is a word that should be eliminated from the dictionary. Actually, it does not exist in the dictionary, and it should never be added. It's deduplication. Deduplication sure. is a funny word. Because duplication itself is ambiguous. I, f I count at least three or four meanings for the word duplication. But there is one particular duplication that is uh, actually not in the data as you receive it, but is produced by you in the moment when you make a forbidden join, although no one has ever told you that it's, that it's forbidden. So deduplication means I create a problem and then I try to find a patch to fix, like mean, max, uh, level of detail, syntax, and so on. And that's really bad. The book says, recognize a problem and avoid it. So in, in the chapter called fun, The Fun Trap, I indicate three different ways of connecting, uh, of solving the, the fun trap. And that's just an example. There are also the chasm traps and, and many other problems that you need to first of all recognize, and then you need, instead of just joining and watch whatever you have produced, no, you need to recognize the problem and say, this is a problem, I want to fix it. Okay, we have just a few minutes, I see, you see time is uh, going quickly. So the universe star schema is the answer to this problem. So the book shows how to create a data mart that is ready to use. It is solving the fun traps, the custom traps, it's solving the loops, solving the non-conform granularities, and basically it delivers to you a star schema where in the center you have a table called bridge, or some people call it now the Pupini Bridge. Pupini is my surname, so they call it the Pupini Bridge, which is quite funny. <laughs> and then all around this bridge table, you put all the tables. But let me tell you one more thing. In my methodology, there is no more distinction between fact tables and dimensions. I don't need that. Also because that distinction is wrong, because it assumes that the measures always appear in the fact tables, which is not true. Measures sometimes are in the dimensions. So, um, and also it assumes that fact tables point to dimensions, which is not true, because very often facts point to facts. 
we have seen it a minute ago with the orders and order details, knowing that order, orders, headers sometimes contains uh, measures. So the basic approach of the dimensional modeling of Kimball is simplistic because it makes assumptions that, yeah, it would be great if they were real, but they are not, <laughs> they are not real. So yeah, the presentation goes, uh, goes on and on, but I need to stop. So I can I can uh, share it with you later. But the idea is that there is a switchboard, uh, like a central table that uh, connects anything with, with anything. And for the end users, it's very easy because they can connect the things exactly as you were doing with the computers like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And you were connecting the green with the green and the violet with the violet. So you don't need to know the details. They just tell you, your keyboard has a violet cable connected to the violet hole. That's it. You don't need to understand. And uh, the, with the tables, it's, it's the same. You have many tables. Imagine that you only need the sales and products, which are cable, table A and table D, for example. Then you take these two tables, you connect them to the universal uh, table called the bridge or Pupini bridge, and you connect them by name. You don't need to worry anymore because who has created the bridge has already created the solution. And then for the end users, it's easy because they can create the unify star schema in Tableau. They can create it in click view. They can create it in click sense. They can create it in Power BI. They can create it in typical spot fire. They can create it in size sense and with, with any other BI tool. And this is very easy to use. And it is solving most of the problems, not all. For some, you still need to do a bit of coding, but it is a foundation for all the present and for the future business requirements. So that girl who was speaking before, uh, I see only initials, but uh, she was saying, yeah, because the business requirements are changing. Yes, with my approach, believe it or not, I've applied for six clients. Uh, you make a data model that applies also for the future business requirements. So new requirements with the same data structure as you had before, it means you don't change your data model. And the good news is that it is a star schema. So for this reason, it is adaptable to every existing architecture and technology that supports the star schema, which to my knowledge is all. I don't know any, any platform of business intelligence that doesn't allow building a star schema. So it is universal because it has all the possible answers to all the possible business requirements, or uh, at least a good foundation to, to start with. And it uh, applies to all the technologies that are compatible with the dimensional, with the old dimensional modeling. And it solves uh, uh, the fun traps, the chasm traps, multi-fat queries, uh, it uses the union as, a, as the key uh, element to combine uh, the, the stages of this uh, of this pinny bridge, uh, and then the book talks about the importance of combining union and aggregation. It's another topic that I could speak a, a long time. Um, and there is one final thing I want to tell you. This is the unified star schema. No, this is the Northwind database as uh, they give you. Uh, in, uh, in the Microsoft documentation. So this is a bit messy. You, you have things going one under. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit like a labyrinth. It's not easy to watch. But I, am, I have invented a, a methodology to organize data models in a different way. In my methodology, all the tables are uh, pointing from left to right. So whenever you have a, a pair of tables, you always have a foreign key in one and a primary key in the other. So this is assuming that uh, the many-to-many -many relationships uh, do not exist because actually many-to-many -many joins are killers because they produce duplicates of numbers. And I have a solution for that, which is in the chapter of, of multi-fact queries, but you should never make a join between two fact tables. So normally with each pair of tables, you you 95% of the cases, you have a foreign key and a primary key. And that's the case of Northwin. There is not one single line here that uh, is an exception. They are all many to one, many to one, many to one, many to one, many to one. They are all many to one. Uh, so you put the many on the left and the one on the right. And this way it's like combing you're combing your data model and it becomes a thing very easy to read because you know that one customer has multiple orders, but each order has one customer. 
an employee as a, uh, each employee has multiple orders. So you can see the hierarchy, how the data is exploding. The tables on the right are very small. And the more you go to the left, the more you go towards a uh, fine granularity because it's one too many, too many. So this way you can detect the pitfalls because if you add the information, which does not exist to my knowledge in this report, for each table, you need to say if it contains at least one measure. And when this is the case, then you see immediately that these two tables, category and products, they are okay because the categories doesn't have numbers. So there is not a number that is exploded by products. But these two tables are not because products is a table that contains numbers because there is the information about the stock, which is a measure. So if you do a join between products and order details, this is a fun trap because these two tables form a fun trap because there is one table with a measure exploded by a table with a, a bigger granularity. So with, with this methodology of oriented data model, you can detect the problems and you detect them before it's too late and you fix the problems before creating a problem. And, uh, and this is the key principle of the unified star schema. And I need to stop here. Francesco, thank you very much. Is it possible for you to just look at a quick demo to show the people what that bridge table looks like? Sure, sure. Um, I, I could, uh, I tell you the other day I was using this uh, and I was speaking for four hours and uh, I had still topics that uh, I could add on top of that. So, um, um, in the book, there are uh, uh, 16 chapters. I started writing from 10 until 16. The part before is from Billy Edmond. And for example, in the chapter of multi-fact queries, uh, I am showing an example of multiple fact queries. So I am showing, uh, we will clearly go beyond the 30, but um, I'm, I'm okay with that. Someone will need to leave, I understand. But to show you this, I will need probably more than five minutes. Um, so I've made an example of two very, very simple tables. Look at this. This is sales, and it has a sales ID, date, client ID, product, quantity, amount. So it's a fact tables. These are numbers. These are measures. And then purchases. So imagine that you have a business where you buy something from your suppliers and then you sell it. So purchases does not have the clients. It must have some supplier ID, but we don't need it. But what matters is that it has a product ID and a, and a date as well. So you may say, OK, this is a fact table because purchase uh, date, product ID, uh, product name, the quantity, the price, the amount. So these are facts. So these are two fact tables, and they do not point to each other. So according to my methodology, they cannot be joined together. So if you don't join these two tables, what can you do? You can do the union of their foreign keys. So let me show you. Um, so this is how the bridge is. OK, so the tables are the same. Just in my methodology, you always need to add one, one column, which, has, which is called key underscore, and then the name of the table. So sales has key sales, purchases has key purchases. Products, guess what, has key products. And then the, uh, the bridge is combining. So these are stages, and they are one underneath each other. So there is a union. You imagine that there are four different uh, pieces of, of, a, of bridge table, and then with the union, you combine these stages. So what, what happens? That sales points to itself, points to sales, but it also points to products and it points to the calendar. Then the purchases does not point to sale. There is no foreign key here, but it points to itself and it also points to products and it also points to the calendar. And then these two, they are added just to obtain what I call the full outer join effect. But this is, this is the key point. Because you have created a union, then when you left join the tables against this table, then you will have no duplicates because sales will join to this table. Purchases will, will join to this. Okay, then so sales will join to this uh, stage. Purchases will join to this stage. 
but then products products it will join to these three stages so you will have the same table products that is uh, has a foreign key here but it has it here and it has it here so product will be denormalized against the three stages and the calendar will be denormalized against the first the second and the fourth stage why is this important because this way you have all the numbers that you need but you don't have duplicates the numbers that are in the sta sales stage they are not exploded by the purchases and vice versa so you have no duplicates of numbers and in the moment when you want to make a report that shows for example uh, the sales versus purchases by product category which is an attribute of the products then the product category you have it across all the three stages and you can easily produce a report by doing drag, drag and drop so basically with this approach the end users they do not need to go to the IT when they have a new business requirement because I challenge you with this structure it, uh, you will probably not find any business requirement that is not satisfied by by this structure so this is a, a, a universal way of connecting the tables because it has no loss of data no loss of data all the data is available because you have a stage also for each dimension so you have a sort of a full outer join effect if there is a product that you have never sold or never purchased you will still see it here so it looks like a full outer join but it is actually a left join so every table you left join it to the pupini bridge this is the pupini bridge and you do a left join of each table that you, that you're adding and by doing this even if it's a left join it is in fact a full outer join because of these stages that have all the elements that appear in every dimension and you end up having a large um, denormalized table but it is a smart denormalization because it's a denormalization which has no losses and no duplicates so basically if you were to build something for the north wind database you'd have the stage column and then a list of every single primary key uh, in in your bridge table basically primary key and foreign key so for each for each stage yeah, yeah, yeah. you true, have true. the trivial connection to itself and then these are the values the, the valuable yeah. parts because this is the primary but these are the foreign and sure. that's, what, that's where I suppose you have, what have fun yeah so what what we're saying is that for example in in the bridge table we've got the stage and then basically the the key fields of all the tables in the bridge table and that's how you you basically don't need to ask the business for requirements is that exactly exactly so you don't need to ask for the business requirements and then i have a final question because we promised the book so imagine that this table has 20 rows because one is the header so the question to the fastest person is when you join you make a left join against this table with all the other tables how many rows you will have after doing the join the left join in the normal so, way five someone says five so i repeat the question this is a pupini bridge the pupini bridge has 20 rows then you do a select from pupini bridge left join sales left join purchases left join products how many rows will you have someone says five anyone else Because I have to tell you, five is not the correct answer. Would it be 20? You were not participating to the contest. <laughs> because how about, how about 20? You win. <laughs> 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 correct. It's a left join. And because because all the tables that you join, the jo this uh, the cardinality is always many to one. Because when you do a left join with sales, it basically you take sales. This is the key one, two, three, four, five, and you do a left join against this. 
So basically it will append the, the rows of sales here and then it will be null here, okay? And then you do the same also for, for purchases. So with purchases, you, you will you will do left, uh, select from Copini Bridge, left joint purchases. So this is the key, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. So it will, you do a left join and you will populate this one. So the basically the rows of purchases will appear only only here and they will be null uh, to all the other places. But one thing that is sure is that this join will not increase the number of rows of the resulting table because this is a foreign key that points to a primary key. We know for sure that there will be no repetitions of P1 in the table of purchases because by definition, it's a primary key. It's called key purchases and it is unique. So you will never have a case when the join explodes a row. And because it is a left, whatever you join here, it will leave the number of rows unchanged. So if your Pupini bridge has 20 rows and you left join everything, the result will be 20 rows. Johan, you got a question? Uh, yes, um, actually I did manage to get back uh, very quickly this actually with my other meeting. Um, just a quick uh, question about this bridge table. Um, well, there's um, sort of two, but they, but I think they go hand in hand. Um, this table, um, is this table because like when you need to update or amend or load this table or even read from it, is this table not going to be a very hard? It's going to be a very what? A very hot table. So that's going to be a table which which joins. Everybody's going to use this table all the time. I'm looking more from a back end point of view, like updating the table, changing things, adding things like yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. Um, and yes, the table will be very hot. But I, I see I see where you're coming from. Um, so there will be a lot of uh, traffic against this table. But uh, here's the trick. I see that the question is really coming from someone, someone who is really like thinking hands on. And it's a very, very good question. So the Pupin bridge is actually not one table. It's not one table. It's in this case, it will be four tables. So you will have a table called sales underscore PB, like Pupin bridge. And then you have, you have your table sales and then you have your table sales PB. So imagine that now sales needs to be updated in your in your data warehouse because you are doing a delta a night reload and instead of five rows you have five plus three okay so this table sales which has five rows it will have five plus three it will have eight rows so when you update that table you also update the table uh, called the sales underscore pb uh, and you will make sure that you will have not five rows in the sales underscore PB table, but you will have eight rows. So each update of a table updates also its correspondent stage for the Pupini bridge. So this way you don't put hands on a table that is by everyone, but rather whenever you have the permissions to override the sales table, because it is uh, the moment for the sales table to be uh, updated, then of course, if you can update the original table, it's also quite easy to update the stage that corresponds to that table. Okay. Um, then just a second part of this. Um, this may be slightly in, out of context, but but it's got to do with the bridge. Would a bridge, would it work well, or have you had any experience with using the this, your bridge table with Hadoop? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, JSON format. Uh, there is. Uh, you're speaking about Hadoop with JSON data or CSV or normal JSON. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So again, when it comes to that, I I needed to go before before start writing uh, um, about uh, solution. I should rather start talking about uh, problems. So one of the challenges here is that when it comes to JSON. Uh, you don't have a definition of the fun trap. You, you don't have basically a definition of the problems. So that's why in the book I was adding one one paragraph. What, what's happening? Someone is having a microphone with a lot of noise. Johan, is it yours? 
Um, no, it wasn't mine. Oh, okay. It's not, okay. Me. It's not me. Sorry, it was me. Okay, no problem. Stop hammering the table. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I'll destroy your table. Okay, so yeah, I was saying I have first of all given a definition because I again I'm asking you, I'm not aware, but I, I believe that okay, you can but uh, Sorry, no, it was not that one. Uh, the front track, okay, it was here. Here we go. So, there is a, a gap in literature because no one has defined the, the problems that uh, the book is solving. They have a definition or sometimes not very correct, but they have it in the relational world. But I'm not aware of a definition of fun trap. So I have given this definition in the book. I'm saying that you have a fun trap in a JSON, uh, uh, in a JSON um, file. If you have a measure, like duration, the duration of a film, uh, for example, is, a, is a, an example of a measure, and then you have a nested array, so in the moment when you go for flattening this uh, this JSON file, it means that if you have a film uh, that has 100 minutes, but it's a comedy, then you have another film of 100 minutes and it's a drama, it's all fine. But in the moment when you have a film that has a duration of 100 minutes, which is both a comedy and a drama, then in the moment when you go to flatten this JSON file into a relational table, the relational table will have four rows, not three. And that hundred number will be repeated. So um, I'm not aware, but this is a question for you. If there are tools that uh, make business intelligence directly against the data in JSON format, what I've seen until now is everyone turns the JSON into into relational, and that's the weak point because this operation, according to my definition, is forbidden. You file if you have a measure and the nested array. Um, now. Curious to, to hear from you because this is uh, like the topic of the next book that I want to write. Are we still connected? Um, yeah, yes, we are. Actually, sorry, I'm got a little bit of a brain dead at the moment here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do I have a question for you? How do you do business intelligence against uh, against uh, Hadoop today? Well, the only thing is, well, a project I worked on is sort of actually having a hybrid uh, between SQL Server and actually Hadoop, and with kind of bridges and things like that. Very, uh, um, it's not something I agreed with. So. Um, I guess I don't really know because I, 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 that's something I've now been trying to kind of look at and see, well, actually, how can you actually bring in Hadoop where, where a lot of companies, they only want to use Hadoop and Cloudera, you know, they don't want to use any, you know, so they want to use Hadoop so that data scientists, everybody can just use Hadoop, which I don't think is, or, or actually maybe your technique that then could be practical to actually use Hadoop. Yeah, so basically uh, there is a, ba a gap in the market. There is Hadoop, which is uh, excellent for a few use cases, but Hadoop is very, very weak when it comes to uh, doing analytics. So Hadoop is, uh, is born as a, as, a, as a transactional system, which updates very quickly the data. It doesn't have problem of read or write. Uh, so it is very efficient, it is distributed, whatever. But I was attending a, a presentation of, of a guy who works uh, in a company called Amazon, and he is responsible of uh, delivering the reporting uh, about the Amazon activity. And he says, well, we, we turn all the Hadoop into, uh, 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 into, when it comes to business intelligence, we turn all our Hadoop uh, data, and when it comes to Amazon, it's quite a lot of data, uh, into a, a DynamoDB relational database, because this is the only way that we are able to, to, to cope with that. So to my knowledge today, 
there is only one tool that uh, tries to do business intelligence against uh, Hadoop in its native format. It's from MongoDB, it's called Atlas, but uh, it doesn't work basically. So uh, it's not capable of, uh, of, uh, of uh, aggregating data with the same efficiency as uh, the relational data does. So my assumption is that whoever wants to do uh, business intelligence, like analysis uh, against the data that is in JSON format, to my experience, they all turn the JSON into relational. And in the moment when they do that, they do this operation of flattening. But if you do the flattening, you need to be aware of a thing called uh, JSON which in literature does not exist. It's, I believe, only written in my book. And when that is the case, you cannot flatten. So the alternative is that you need to break a JSON file into two uh, relational tables, one containing the numbers and one containing the nested uh, array. And only this way you're able, by applying the, the three solutions that I'm writing in my book, you're able to make sure that you turn a JSON file into a credible uh, relational uh, data set, which will give you correct results. Okay, uh, I guess can I, you know, because I, I guess I don't want to hog the questions, but can I just, uh, in, in relation to this, uh, actually, what about um, actually columnar databases? Wouldn't columnar databases also actually help in this bridge table, or haven't you really uh, worked with columnar databases in this sense? Well, uh, columnar, the columnar is not really changing the, the, the logical. Um, columnar is just a technique for optimizing the, the physical storage, but uh, a columnar database is typically relational. It's just a, a, using less disk, disk space, but it's still a relational database. Or? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's correct. Okay. So it's a column store index that you use on SQL or, or, or something like that. Yeah, so columnar is not changing the principles, basically. It's just a good, efficient way of storing, but which is uh, the your, logical which is, is, no. is relational. No, which is what okay. your Power BI and in-memory are doing in terms of the compression at, at, a, at a columnar level or column level. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess, well, okay, thanks for answering that. Look, I actually take that offline with you. Thanks. Okay. So, are, are, there, are there any other questions? I'd, I just wanted to confirm before any, anyone drops off. Um, Tammy, uh, I think it was Tammy, Francesco, you, someone else answered and you said, no, not you. And then you, and then you, yeah. then you went to Tammy. I just wanted to confirm that somebody else, was that someone you know, Francesco, or? Uh, no, I mean, you gave the correct answer, but, uh, but then. No, 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 it wasn't me. It wasn't me that answered. I think it was somebody oh. else. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh my God, is he still no in the problem. call? Yes, I am. I was wondering why I wasn't allowed to answer. Thanks. Oh my God, please, <laughs> Joseph, Thomas, Joseph, please accept my apologies. I thought it was the, the <laughs> so you're actually the winner in this case. Yeah. Sorry for that. Sorry. Basically, because you got a left out to join, you won't, you won't do, you have the same number of records. Thomas, um, Thomas, so certainly if you if you'd like to contact me or send me your details, I'll make sure that you get the copy of the book. Thank you, Howard. Yeah, I'll 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 do that. Thank you. Sorry, Tammy, I, I didn't mean to cut you out. I just I just recognized that it wasn't me. That that's okay. If if it I didn't win it fairly then. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I, okay, are there, are there any other questions that you guys would like to ask Francesco? Um, so, would the bridge table, since the bridge table has only keys, then <coughs> when new data gets entered into the data warehouse, would it only be additions to the um, the bridge table and not updates being made to the rows and would that help yeah so uh, I have a, a wonderful answer for you um, you know uh, 
the, the nice thing that I'm very proud of is that I, with this book, with this methodology, I'm adding uh, a few hints, but I'm, I'm basically saying, guys, how have you done until today? So that's a bit my answer in, in most cases. So here, the, the answer to your question is very simple. The answer is with a question. What are you doing with your sales table? So if with your sales table, you are doing an incremental load, then the portion of bridge will do an incremental load. So whatever you are doing, uh, whatever you were doing before using my approach, you just keep doing that. And, and actually the, the real process, it's even easier because uh, what I suggest typically is you do whatever you want, to, you, you are doing with, the, with the, your sales table. So you have a delta load based on key, based on timestamp, whatever, you apply your logic, you're done. Okay, from this moment I arrive and I say, thank you, this is a new sales table. So let me take from this sales table all the relevant keys and I throw away the, the, the key, the, the, the um, bridge uh, stage that we had before and I replace it with a new bridge stage. Um, then of course you can uh, you can see it in many ways, but typically uh, because the the delta load is using not only a primary key but it's also using an update timestamp, and that update timestamp is available in sales, but it's not available in the in the bridge table. Um, it, it is more sensible to just apply the logic that you had before. And when you're done, you're basically saying, okay, I take those five columns that I need from the new renovated uh, sales table and I just replace uh, uh, the existing bridge portion with the new bridge portion. But I have to say, I have not done it. I'm just using my, my, my fantasy, you know? So uh, at the moment, I, I have implemented this with, um, for six clients. And it was amazingly successful. And I told them, okay, now give me whatever business requirements you, you have in mind that you are able to do with freehand SQL. And I will prove you that I already have the data model for that. And they never caught me wrong. I mean, it was always working. So um, the, the way how to um, expand, like uh, how to extend this discipline uh, to, to cases that were not my use cases until now, uh, well, that's exact, exactly the adventure that I'm looking for. So basically, I'm I'm hoping to be challenged by by new uh, uh, logical change challenges and physical challenges, and uh, we can find solutions together. But knowing that I have basically eradicated the problem of duplicates, I think that I I deserve uh, like a bit of attention. And uh, whatever system problem we have, I believe that principles come first and uh, uh, system challenges come second. So if I have really solved the problem of eradicating the duplicates and delivering always correct numbers, as I believe is the case, then uh, I'm quite sure we can deal with uh, storing a uh, delta reload. I'm not worried about that. I think, Francesco, the other, the other big benefit that you get is that um, if you look at those bridge tables, they they pretty much the design is is something like the the data vault and that and the anchor modeling where it's always additive. So you'll you'll typically never remove columns and and you you'll be predominantly adding columns when new keys are added, which which is also helpful in terms of your maintenance window and your maintenance processes. Yeah, I, I already now, while you were speaking, I, I already designed in my mind a solution. So imagine that you have in your data vault uh, a large table which requires uh, a night uh, uh, delta, delta load. So you, you detect in your data source what are the uh, new records to be uh, appended to, to your uh, link and, uh, and satellites. So you do that um, and then when you're done, you basically compare the keys because everything is key based. So uh, you you have now updated your main table of sales, and then you look at at your uh, uh, sales uh, underscore pb like the Cupidi Bridge uh, stage, and and you scan your sales table and you say for all the uh, rows of sales table 
uh, that do not exist in the Puffini Bridge uh, uh, stage, uh, get to those rows and uh, just uh, retrieve only the, uh, for those rows, only the relevant columns, which are the primary key and all the foreign keys that need to be uh, appended to the bridge. So oh, it's just an easy operation of, uh, uh, it's an easy set operation. Once the uh, main re reload has been done, it's just to select where not exists, something like uh, that, where not in, something like that. Yeah. Excellent. Guys, any, Jan, you got another question? Um, yes, I was actually sorry to be such a, <laughs> That's normal. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't be sorry about your normal. Right. Yes, my normal. Um, now, this is more just a very high-level question. Okay. So, if now, we, now we're introducing another layer, yet another layer for business or whatever, uh, somewhere between business and IT, actually, how would you position it from a high level to actually um, – actually convince powers to be or even technical people, business people, that we actually need to build this new layer which will satisfy all the questions, or do you just have to show them? Okay, so by the way, have I activated the camera now that I've stopped sharing? I probably should re restore yes, the camera. Oh, here you go. So here I am. So thanks for the question, and I have a wonderful news for you. There is no new layer. So in the book, I'm, I'm writing that the Unifister schema is just another data mart. And this is the tricky thing. So in organizations, if you say, hey, I need to add a new layer in, in your architecture, and that involves the data architects, a panic. Yeah. But you go to an organization and you say, you have 120 data marts. So how about we go for the 121st? So it's just another data mart. You don't need to call the architect. It's just another data mart. So this is the tricky thing. So you begin uh, bottom up. <clears throat> you begin in this data mart <laughs> to do as you normally do. Like you say, okay, this is a data mart for sales and, and purchases. And you just put this, uh, these uh, bits. So you put like five or six tables. Um, and then you need to add some more information and you say, you know what, instead of making the 122nd data mart, I put it in the 121st, like I, I put it there. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. So I begin to populate this data mart more and more. So from the architectural point of view, the Unifister schema will be just another data mart, which becomes more and more successful. So it will, it will have a higher temperature, but it doesn't change the architecture. So this way, it's quite easy to to fit into the into the business uh, into the IT infrastructure because it does not involve any architecture. Okay, all right. No, thanks very much because that's always uh, my big problem. Or sometimes when you get in, you know, when you start uh, mentioning new things, you want to do something new, then suddenly you get uh, twenty. 40 people who say, no, no, we can't do new things, you know, and these things, but okay, this is a very sort of just a sly, or not a sly way, but a very sort of sideways, okay, well, just a new mod to try You can out. implement it without okay. them knowing it. So you, right. you can even say, you know what, I'll do it, I'll change a bit, like, or you don't say anything. I say, this is the, the, the mod that you asked me, and then after just six months, they realized that it was a, a unifier schema with a Puppini bridge. They don't need to know. All right, thanks very much. Actually, I have to leave, but thank you very okay. much. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Excellent. Francesco, I'd like to just thank you. I, I don't know of any other questions, but thank you very much for spending time. Um, and um, we will certainly add it on LinkedIn, and hopefully the discussions can continue there as well. It is All right, here. guys. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank, you. thank you for everybody joining. Really appreciate it.